Okay, so um, thank you all for coming for, for this uh, last this last panel of the of the day. Um, today we're, we're going to be talking about jo jo uh, joining the sector as a career change. Uh, we have uh, three panelists um, for you. We have Max uh, from uh, from Provenor Economics. We have Claudine from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, and we have Anne Raymond and Anne from uh, uh, the Health Foundation. So how how it's going to work is we're going to have uh, Going to give them five minutes to uh, to give themselves a, a quick introduction, their current role, and a brief overview of, of what they're doing in the in, in the think tank space, and then also how they then how they then also moved into the sector from their from their from their, from their other roles. So we're going to have about 15 minutes um, afterwards for, for, for Q and A session, um, and if you could either raise your hands at the at the end, at the end of the, the session or um, just just pop your questions in chat to now and direct the questions to our three big panelists. So um, we'll start with sort of Max. Thanks, Jamie. Um, hi, so yeah, I'm Max. I'm a uh, research and policy analyst at Pro Bono uh, Economics, a charity that uses economics to empower the social sector um, and increase well-being across the UK. Uh, I mostly conduct research into the problems facing the social sector and explore policy-driven ways of overcoming these. Um, but I also support on some other projects that focus on understanding the impact of charities uh, delivering services. Um, so my work mainly involves planning and conducting uh, desk research, so mostly literature reviews and data analysis. Um, but I also support the work of other members in the research and policy team, help to coordinate uh, projects and inputs from our external network and work with our communications team to produce our own uh, sort of research reports. Um, I'm about to begin some qualitative research, hopefully interviewing some grant makers, which is a new experience for me. And um, I'm also going to be working on developing some policy for the first time. Uh, prior to joining PBE, I was working in academia. I got my PhD in musicology and Africana studies, um, which involved a combination of desk research, teaching and a variety of uh, administrative functions. But by the time I graduated, I think my academic research had begun to feel pretty abstracted from the topics I was writing about, and I wanted to do something more socially engaged. Um, and so working in a think tank seemed like an obvious transition, and there's a good amount of literature uh, sort of targeting academic, uh, academia leavers that advocates for it. So uh, the summer I graduated, I, I started applying for jobs with think tanks, um, working on a range of topics from civil society to environmental issues. Um, and I didn't know much about the topics, but I focused on uh, jobs whose skill requirements aligned most closely with my experience. And I tried to build my applications around transferable skills like research skills, planning and conducting projects with deadlines and communication skills. Um, so I've currently been at PBE for about 18 months. When I first joined, I didn't know much about the social sector and I didn't have uh, much experience in either quantitative or qualitative research methods. Um, but I found that my desk research skills have been pretty transferable, which has allowed me to learn a lot about the social sector and contribute to some to some research projects. Uh, and I've also been fortunate to get the chance to begin developing some new skills. So, for instance, I've begun developing some skills using data driven programming languages um, and some of my favorite moments working at PBE so far. I've actually been working on projects involving lots of data work in Excel and R, which has been uh, pretty surprising given my background in the, in the humanities. Um, with that being said, the transition has also required some uh, adaptation. I would uh, I'd say that the, the pace of research is quicker in the think tank sector and you move between topics a lot more. Um, it involves a lot more team working than was my experience of academia. You have to be able to strategize with people, and delegate and be a good team player. Uh, you spend a lot more time in meetings with a wider range of people from civil servants and academics to practitioners in your area. Uh, the, the modes of communication are quite different in terms of things like target audiences, language and tone, and, and the output you produce. And you also need to be able to produce content in a, in a range of styles from sort of short micro blogs to longer form research reports. But uh, fortunately, you'll likely have the support of the comms or external affairs team who can sort of guide you there and help also drive the impact of your work. Um, overall, my experience is that the transition from academia into the think tank world sort of turns on a, a set of pivot points. So like your research skills and, and, and the other experiences you, you, you gain in, in academia um, can sort of help you hit the ground running, but you just have to be open to learning new skills and ways of working. Um, but my experience has been, as you sort of begin to see the impact of your, the, that your organizations have, in, it can be a, a really rewarding sector to work in. Okay, thank you. Um, now, next we're gonna have, 
Claudine speaking, please. Yeah, hi, hi, um, evening everyone. So yeah, I'm Claudine uh, Bo Ukraine. I'm Associate Research Director for Education and Skills at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. And my role primarily is um, to, um, well, it's very varied. So a lot of the time I spend um, putting funding applications together for projects, supporting, uh, you know, pro managing projects, supporting um, the team at the, at the Institute to run projects as well as um, lots of dissemination and knowledge exchange activities through um, written reports, blogs, um, opinion pieces, and um, as well as sort of webinars and, and lectures and things. Um, my background, like Max, I come from um, a career in academia. So my career before I joined NISA followed a typical academic path. So undergrad, PhD, postdoc, and then lectureship, senior lectureship, um and um you know that and, and all that that entailed in terms of juggling the teaching and the administration as well as trying to do the research um which you know is, is clearly quite quite difficult particularly in the recent years in higher education um and during that time my research really became increasingly more applied so my field is um children's reading and language development and um after my phd i moved away from sort of theoretical kind of um, looking at the, the sort of theories behind children's reading and language development to looking at designing and evaluating interventions for children who have language difficulties. And then um, about five, six years ago, I got involved in a project called Better Start Bradford, which is a public health project um, commissioned by the National Lottery that looks at improving the life chances of children and families in Bradford through commissioning lots of different services, including speech and language services. And I was involved and still am involved in the evaluation of those services. And so I really felt that I wanted to move away from the higher education um, route of research, which primarily relies on um, getting your research out through peer reviewed journal articles, you know, your, your um, metrics of um uh you know you're judged on how many peer-reviewed journal articles you've got out and i wanted to move into a more a sector where it was more about what difference you can actually make to the people's lives and to try and get that research to policy to practice um pathway moving much quicker than a sort of waiting two years for a research article to get published and so i applied for the job at nisa and, and that's where I am now. And like Max, I think I agree, um, the research cycle is much quicker. Um, it's a much, much uh, quicker pace of research. Funding applications go in and projects can start very quickly. Whereas, you know, in the academic sector, typically, you know, the funding application will go in. It will take about 18 months before you can even start it. So the, the pace is quicker, but the, the other, thing, other thing I really like about it is that the, um, the level of bureaucracy is much much more reduced things can happen much more quickly and you can get your research out much more quickly than um than typically you can in when you're in higher education um so i i think it's been a very positive move and um one that i'm glad i made about 18 months two years ago well just before the first lockdown so that that long ago that's it that's me Okay, thank you very much. Um, next we have Anne. Hi everyone, I'm Anne Raymond. Uh, I work as an economist for uh, the Health Foundation, which is basically an independent charity that aims to improve the health and care of people in the UK. And um, it tries to do this through a number of different ways. So it provides basically funding to different organizations that work in the health and care space. Um, it tries to um, influence policy making um, and it also, uh, the organization does its own sort of in-house research and analysis, which would help create a better evidence base um, and make sure that policies have like really strong um, research and data underpinning them. Um, so within the Health Foundation, I work in this team called the RAIL Center. RAIL is an acronym. It stands for Research and Economic Analysis in the Long Term. So this is a relatively um, new team. Uh, we are a group of um, economists, um, project managers and analysts in the team. And what we try to do is basically um, we, uh, again, like produce evidence, try to inform public debate through research and analysis, which 
mainly informs long-term decision making. So we try and um, sort of influence policymakers and make them think about the implications of you know decisions that they make and the consequences it can have, like maybe 10 to 15 years from now, and make sure that when they make those decisions, they have like a really strong evidence base and analysis underpinning it. So that's um, that is basically what my specific team does. Um, so as part of the economist role, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I do a lot of um, statistical analysis using um, different data sets, mainly um, patient data um, using the software called R. Um, I'm involved in basically project planning, project management, um, and doing things like literature review for the project, making sure that uh, what, how do we, how does the evidence that we are going to put out contribute to what's already out there. Um, and then we um, communicating. So I think what Max spoke about communicating your evidence, your outputs is also like a really integral part of my role. Um, uh, so yeah, so making sure, you know, who is your target audience? Like, how do you communicate your findings? Like, what are the best avenues to do that? So that is, um, yeah, that's also a very critical part of my role. Um, before coming to the Health Foundation, I used to work for the Greater London Authority. So that's basically London's uh, government. And uh, within uh, the Greater London Authority, I was a research analyst for the London Assembly. So that is a group of elected politicians called the Assembly members who basically hold the mayor of London to account and uh, scrutinize his policies. So again, it was really important that for effective scrutiny, you basically need to have like really strong research underpinning it uh, to make sure that, yeah, you're doing a good job. Um, so yeah, that involved, so it was different from the Health Foundation in the sense that I would basically work on a range of issues, anything that was pertinent to London, actually. So, you know, like one day I would be working on transport, the next day I would be working on something to do with like housing. So, yeah, uh, essentially I, I worked on like a really wide variety of topics and issues that were relevant to uh, London. Um, so yeah, so I've worked in multiple roles within the GLA actually, so I've also worked as a, um, in research and worked with demography and migration and census data quite a lot. Um, and actually before that I was in uh, academia as well, so I worked in UCL and I was working on an NHS project where we were evaluating different technologies that helped improve the lives of older people. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of been uh, my journey. Uh, I'm, in terms of academic qualifications, I have a master's in economics. Um, and I think the main difference from, so I was, when I was at the GLA, basically the Greater London Authority, I was quite aware of the Health Foundation as an organization because we came across their reports and, their, and the, the work that they produced quite a lot. Um, and yeah, so I knew it was a very interesting, they, a very interesting organization that the work that they did, they always seem to have like a really nice pipeline of interesting projects. Um, so yeah, and I think there is definitely like think tanks because I think you're more influential when it comes to, you know, like being, and you're definitely much more visible. And um, when it comes to getting your work out and making sure that the people who make these decisions and who need to see your work, they do see your work. So I think that is that was like a real um, that was one of the main aims on why like I moved to uh, the think tank sector. And also, again, like I think things like, you know, communicating your findings and understanding your target audiences, those are all really valuable skills that I have learned after coming to the um, Health Foundation, especially because like previously, like the kinds of work that I produced, it was much more internal, like the audiences were always internal, they weren't really external facing reports. Whereas now you are producing things that are seen by like a wide variety of people. So that's been like really interesting learning those things, how to like tailor your messages and um, and yeah, and they always uh, they have a, like a really good pipeline of projects, and yeah, definitely the impact that think tanks can make is also like a huge attraction on why you'd want to work in the sector. So, thanks very much. Okay, yeah, thank you everyone for for uh, for your sort of brief sort of histories. Um, we've had some very sort of lovely questions in in uh, in chat. Uh, 
I'm going to harass Max for the first one, um, looking at um, how, how the best ways in which to move uh, from a postgrad in the in the in the humanities subject to working in a in in a think tank. So if you could talk about um, that, it'd be great. So the the best ways to move from the humanities into working in in in, in a think tank. Yeah, uh, I think you know if you if if whoever asked the question if their experience with the humanities is similar to mine. One of the, one of the obstacles is that you come out without um, the, without those sort of two specific sets of, uh, of of research skills that a lot of the job applications call for. Right, you you come out sort of without um, quant research skills, and 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 there's a good chance that you'll come out without clear uh, core skills either. I think that um, I think that my 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 approach to, to segue in was to highlight the things that 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 I that I could do that I thought were transferable. So I think that desk research skills are, are, are still really important, being able to internalize a lot of information, synthesize it, um, sort of bring it together. Um, I think that that's an important foundation, you know, prior to moving on to those next research uh, sort of stages. I think um, gesturing towards these other skills that both uh, Claudine and Anne brought up, I think, think, think things like communication skills that you might have gained through um, through presenting at conferences or through any teaching that you've done and things like that. Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of things uh, surrounding research, that, that, that skills that you might have, even sort of um, administrative uh, experience that you've done and things like that can, can all sort of um, be brought in. And then I think the other side of it is uh, sort of showing an interest and maybe aptitude for developing new skills, like maybe showing an interest in developing those qual or quant skills. Um, and and gesturing towards moments, perhaps like I I had a little little bit like during like an undergrad dissertation I wrote on Mozart where I did a little bit of um, data work, you know, uh, like uh, you know d d digging through his, his uh, and you know you can point to that and say it's not it's not you know I'm not an economist but I, I've, I've I've shown an interest in working with numbers in the past and I think picking out moments like that can can sort of help make your cover letter or your CV make it a bit more tangible. Yeah, thank you. Um... And I've got a question looking uh, about experience in working in government or civil service, uh, and whether how that would gain, uh, uh, whether, how useful is that to work in in, uh, in think tanks? So maybe sort of Anne, if you could talk about that quickly. Yeah, sure. So um, just to say that I think local government works like slightly differently. It's not technically like the civil service that uh, we work in, but I think um, it's it's definitely useful, especially like in my organization, I have seen a lot of like people make that transition from the civil service to um, think tanks. I think the fact that, you know, you are, so your audience, like for us, like our audience are basically like policy um, makers, decision makers, so like ministers and, you know, like, so I think it's quite, it's quite, um, it's a really useful skill if you have been in that sort of environment where you've had to like make your case and like make your arguments to policymakers um, and you produce like reports and things that, um, that help make, build the evidence base that, that policymakers like see. So I think it's definitely, um, it is it is a useful um, environment to have worked in, and it is also something that we see like quite commonly as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is sort of a, a question for for each of you. Uh, how how diverse are are your team's backgrounds? Um, it's good. It's, it, it does seem as if everyone on this panel comes from an academic sort of background. Uh, it would be good for you just to talk, see how to see how how diverse. Your, your sort of team actually is a big, as in, in terms of where, where they actually come from from their prior experience. Um, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, uh, quite, it's fair to say quite a few of the team at NISA do come from um, an academic background. It, although some, some people have chosen to um, stop their academic career path at the level of either masters or PhD and move into think tanks before they've actually gone on to have an academic research, uh, to have an academic career. Um, but then we also do have a, a large number of people at NISA particularly because it's um, quite focused on economic research. We do have a lot of people that have come from you know, the Bank of England and places like that rather than coming through that academic route. So it, it isn't just people that make a switch from academia into um into the think tanks certainly um i think i would say I th I, I, again like especially amongst our economists and and and, and research team we, we a lot of people do, do come from academia um i think that like there's 
it's worth noting that not all of not all think tank work right is is research work we also have like a big comms team and our com our comms team uh, have backgrounds in, in politics and in journalism um and so definitely there that that you know uh, you you might be less likely to find people with um, with backgrounds necessarily in academia um but also not all of our researchers uh, come, uh, come from academia some of them have, have have sort of done sort of think tank proximate work previously like um doing research work in in, in the public sector for example um so but yeah uh, academic academia is pretty prevalent but a, I wouldn't say not, not all of our researchers are acad uh, previous academics and there are a variety of roles that don't necessarily pertain directly to research and policy development. Yeah, so within my specific team, um, I think, yeah, we have a few people, again, who've come from the civil service, actually, we have a mix of, yeah, so we have civil service, um, other think tanks, as well as um, academia. But again, like Max pointed out, so this is like an analysis economics team. We do have a policy team, um, another team that looks at sort of like the wider determinants of health. We have, again, like the communications team, a research team. Uh, so yeah, and also we being a health think tank, we also have a lot of people coming in from the NHS as well. Um, so yeah, I would say that um, academia is by no means like that, that is that represented as a sector, but we definitely have people coming in from the civil service and the NHS as well. Okay, thank you. And then a question for, for everyone, if I, if, if I may. Um, so um, in this, in this, in this, um, in, not, in this, not, in this panel, not, not in this panel, but in, in this session in generally, it's been quite a large focus on quantitative research. Um, do think tanks require like a minimum level of quantitative research skills, or is there, is there also a scope for more, more, qualitative, more qualitative sort of work as well in your, in your, in your think tanks? I think there's room definitely at NISA there's um, room for both and it will just largely depend on the piece of research that you're doing but we do a lot of um, randomized control trials for example that look at educational interventions and a big part of that would be an implementation and process evaluation that would require qualitative skills uh, in addition to the quantitative skills so we do have qualitative researchers that work with us on the team um, and that that research is um, is just as valued as, as the quant research as well. So absolutely, there's a, a, a real mix that goes on depending on what sort of research you're, what sort of questions you're asking. Yeah, I would, I, I, I'd agree with Claudine on that. I'd, I'd say also that I'd just reiterate that I think that there's a lot of, there's a, a, lot, a lot of the work that you'll end up doing and, and there's a lot of space for is other forms of just desk, desk research that aren't really qual or quant, um, that, that are lit reviews, uh, that are synthesizing information, a lot of that's pretty foundational. And also, um, I don't know how, how how true this is across the sector, but at least my experience at PB has been that um, the organization's really in, in, invested in, 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 in developing your skills. And so if you if you don't come in, for example, with a quant background or a qual background, there's always, there, there are loads of opportunities to sort of train up in those areas. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I would say the same. So in my team, again, like it is quite probably like strongly quantitative focus, but again, we're just like one team within the Health Foundation and there are a range of teams doing a lot of different things. Um, and we also, as an organization, commission a lot of research and that involves um, qualitative research as well. Um, and yeah, again, like Max said, I think um, a lot of my day would involve like reading up on my you know, subject area, making sure that I um, I have more information about like what I need to be working on. And that involves, again, like making reading things like papers and um, reports, which is also basically research. And yeah, it's not just like plugging away at spreadsheets or like coding all day. Like that's definitely not the case at all. So. OK, great. Um, some more questions appearing in, in, in the chat. Um, one question, uh, talking about uh, coming into think tanks from either sort of a, a family break or a career sort of break, uh, and how and, yeah, and and whether we whether we know of anyone in our in our whole teams who's who's got gone through that sort of experience before. I don't know of anyone in my particular team that's gone through that experience, but I wouldn't think that it would be um, a huge problem to, to do that 
if you've you know if you've got the experience and then you've had a bit of a break um there's no reason why you shouldn't you know approach uh, apply for for roles at think tanks um if you've had a family break that's just you know that that's just life isn't it um if you've had a career break then maybe sort of thinking about what the um you know if you if you're jumping coming from another career thinking about what skills you can bring with you from that to fit into the think tank but i i can't see it being a particular problem for for think tanks in general yeah um i would yeah i think i agree i i, I don't know i've joined the health foundation a year ago and until um, now i haven't really come across anyone who has in the team who has come from a career or family break but again like i think recruitment in these organizations like I, we're mainly looking for things like what do you like match the skill sets like do you have an interest in like the area um the topic that we're working on and yeah so i don't think things like a career break would mark against you in any way so don't be discouraged by that at all i'd say okay thank you um I'm just trying to see if there's any questions I haven't sort of um, got to. Hey, we have one, one more question. So like, how how would you present transferable skills in the cover letter and applications um, when the, when the, yeah, how, how, would, you, how would you best, how, how would you best, uh, yeah, how would you best uncover your transferable skills from uh, your, your transferable skills uh, into the sort of what the what the, the needs of a of a of a think tank. I think, um, and and this is just sort of advice you, you read a lot, right? When you when you read up on how to write a good a good cover letter, for example. But I think it's about really going through the the spe the, spe the specifics of what the uh, job application calls for and trying to and trying to trying to be big. I think I think there's an element of being creative uh, and 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 also sort of. Um, you know, being open to sort of all, all, all of your experiences, even the ones that might not uh, see, seem immediately relevant, uh, and and I think trying try to be 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 really specific, not only about the the calls in the job application, but trying to give specific examples where you've sort of done something that you you, you could you could see at least elements of it overlapping with, with the thing that's been asked for. Um, you know. Uh, my 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 experiences were none of them aligned directly with the with the things that pro bono economics uh, was, was asking for, but um, yeah, I was able to, to to sort of point to enough specific examples that had at least some some degree of overlap that my application was still really you know successful in the end. So. Yeah, I just I would just totally agree with that actually, Max. It's it's, it's a thing. It's about thinking outside the box and thinking not just relying on your on your work experience but also on all of your life experience and putting that into um the, the person spec and uh, like like you max i um you know I, I work at the national institute of economic and social research and i'm a psychologist so you know it it, it doesn't always seem like you're the right fit but you, you know you actually if you think about it and you really try and look at the person spec carefully and think about all of the skills that you have it, you know, surprisingly, you can find that actually it's the right it's the right place for you. Yeah, and I think I would, um, yeah, I would just add to that, especially I think we have a tendency for, especially when you have these sections on things like problem solving, you know, like decision making or, you know, bits like that, you would, or if you don't have a lot of work experience, you'd be like, oh, what am I going to say for that? But that doesn't necessarily have to be you know, like a work related thing all the time, like you could, those are skills of those are things that you would have to apply in your life, like irrespective, like, or that might have been like different other situations when you were studying or, you know, in other completely other situations where you might have used those. So feel free to tap into those things and like use those examples. And um, I think if you have a story to say, and if it's a compelling story, then yeah, people would definitely listen and be interested. Okay, great. We have one one minute left, um, uh, and I'm there's there seems to be a lot of questions that very specific sort of questions to certain certain to certain think tanks. I've tried my best to sort of uh, avoid those as we're looking at the more general general uh, moving into career. Um, yeah, I think I think we can we can 
close the session here. So we're, we're so we're gonna all the all the um yeah. So thank you. So thank you all for coming. This is this is this is the, this is the last session, and all the recordings will be sent uh, to all the attendees uh, by email, so you can sort of look look back at the other sessions sessions if you missed any of them. Um, okay. So uh, just thank you for thank you for all all our speakers for 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 uh, for giving up their time and to have a to have this quite interesting interesting discussion about uh, working in think tanks. So yeah.